When Eli Wallach appeared on Later with Bob Costas, he was promoting a film called Article 99. It was an incredibly impressive cast, enough so that I went and watched the movie this morning after seeing who was in it. Let's go down the list. Ray Liotta is the star, right after Goodfellas. One of Kiefer Sutherland's first co-starring roles. Also, one of Forrest Whitaker's first co-starring roles. The female lead is Leah Thompson, in between her Back to the Future films and before her television series Caroline in the City. Then you got John C. McGinley, before Scrubs. You got John Mahoney of Frasier playing the corporate bad guy who's not treating the, the veterans well at the VA hospital. Incidentally, everybody should donate to Wounded Warriors. Let's honor our service people who fight for our country and fought for our country. And that's the message in this film, Article 99. But let's move on. Kathy Baker, before the Picket Fences TV series, excuse my itch. <laughs> Kathy Baker makes me scratch a little. Or how most Leah Thompson do. Not Jeffrey Tambor, though. He does not scratch my itch. <laughs> but this is uh, before Arrested Development, obviously. And Eli Wallach playing a, an old uh, veteran who's not getting treated well in the VA. And he must have loved the method acting going on on the set of this film, evidently. His, uh, Frazier's dad was all kind of irritated having to work with Ray Liotta because Ray never left character and treated the corporate bad guy, the actor like the corporate bad guy he was playing off the set and the whole time just glared at him and it was aggressive and mean. So kudos Ray Liotta. You had the method down and R.I.P. he passed away last year too. So Losing a lot of the guys in these 35 year old video recordings I've got. So this is later with Bob Costas, March 19th, 1992, Eli Wallach talking again about method acting in the, studio, uh, the actor's studio in New York City and who was in that scene and the film Article 99, which is worth watching. I enjoyed it. Thanks for staying up later. If you were with us last night, you saw the first half hour with Eli Wallach, and there's no question in your mind why we had to do a second one, so let's continue. Now, when a guy like you, who was, uh, I guess, a charter member of the actor's studio back in the 40s with Lee Strasberg, you know, steeped in the method, when you work with someone who either doesn't understand or doesn't subscribe to the method, does it pose problems in any way or is, does it... Well, the first day I was working with Clark Gable in a movie called The Misfits that John Huston was directing. Yeah. I kept staring and thinking, this guy is the king of the movies. You know, I kept staring. And he kept staring at me as though, who is this kid from Brooklyn, uh, from New York, with this mysterious method? I don't know anything about that. So we were like two animals glued to one another. And Houston said, well, you two start saying your lines. I've got a movie to make here. So uh, I learned we were insufferable at the beginning because we thought we discovered a new religion. And old actors didn't know anything about acting. All you, you people in the actor studio, yes. I mean, who is it? Carl Malden? Carl Malden, Tom Ewell, David Wayne, John Forsythe, Maureen Stapleton, Kim Stanley, Paul Newman. Marlon Brando, all of them. Can you explain it to the layman? I've asked other people about it, about Harvey Keitel and everything. But A man named Herbert Berghoff was doing a play with an old actor, an O'Neill play. And each t night, they'd, he'd read a letter. And just at a certain point, a tear would perch on the tip of his eyelid and fall on the page. And Herbert went to him after six months, every night, at exactly the same time. He said, please tell me how you do it. I, I'm dying to know how you get that emotion every night. And the old actor looked at him and went, he winked, as though to say, who knows? Who knows? It's an amorphous thing. But the method is 
Each actor has his own, devises his own method. Kazan would say in, in my first film, run around the block, run around the block, so that when you come on and you're out of breath, you're really out of breath. You see? Carl Malden, who was starring in that movie, said to me, listen, on camera, your face is that high, 30 feet high, so don't open your mouth too much because they'll see your inlays and your, your tonsils. So the first time I appeared on the screen, the girl appeared at the top of the stairs and she said, hi oh Silva. I said, hi oh <laughs> And the director said, what's the matter? I said, why, what? He said, say hi oh I said, hi oh He said, I don't want the Japanese version. <laughs> he said, say it. I said, what about my tonsils and my, and my, and my teeth? And they, he said, forget it. He said, Carl told you that, didn't he? So, anyway, that was part of the method. But there could be someone who doesn't use the method at all, who is just as good or better than someone who does. It doesn't necessarily make everybody better. It's like a, it's like a batting stance. Whatever works for you, right? Exactly. Ted Williams says, I stand this way and I hold it this way. Some guy will come out there and defy all the uh, rudiments of holding the bat and hit 330. And you say, how the hell does he do it, right? There's some coordination with the eye. There's something in that man's physique, something that makes it work. Your first film, which Ilya Kazan directed, was Baby Doll, right. which was written by Tennessee Williams. Right. Now, you had familiarity with Williams' work. You'd won a Tony for, uh, for performance in one of his plays several years prior uh, on Broadway. But this is like the mid-50s, 55, 56. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'll just try to sum it up quickly. Carol Baker plays this 19 or 20-year-old Southern woman married to a much older guy who's played by Carl Malden. They don't consummate the marriage. There's some weird thing going on. She sleeps in a crib. She sucks her thumb. And then you kind of come into their lives. And in a way, you seduce both of them. That sums it up. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I love it. I said to my wife, she went to see the first screening. And Carl Walden and I stood nose to nose arguing, you know, in one scene. I said, how did you like it? My wife said, never have two noses filled one screen. <laughs> so completely. <laughs> but, you know, the thing about this movie, though, there's, I, I got to read this to get it right. Um, remember, this is 1956, all right? One reviewer wrote, it is one of the most unhealthy and amoral pictures ever made in this country. This one is from uh, Time Magazine. Baby Doll is just possibly the dirtiest American-made motion picture that has ever legally exhibited. In condemning it, the Roman Catholic Legion of Decency declared it dwells almost without variation or relief upon carnal suggestiveness. It's 1956. All I can tell you is it's a very innocent movie. And it's a beautiful movie. Very well done. Um, when Cardinal Spellman said that any Catholic is in danger of being excommunicated if he goes to see the movie, he was asked if he saw the movie. He said, no, if the water supply is poisoned, why drink it? So many years later, I asked a very well-known Catholic lady if she would see it. She said she had never seen it. She was never allowed to see it. She saw it and said, oh, my, it's very innocent. Today, every second word on the screen is, F, F, and all of those words, nothing like that is said in this movie. It is not a carnal, suggestive movie. It's a movie about an eye for an eye and revenge. The scene, though, where your character, what was that character's name? Silva Vaccaro. Yeah, when he seduces the Carol Baker character, that is so sexy. You don't see anything. And I think it's even sexier for it being 1956, because not only do you not see anything in that film, people weren't seeing anything that was overtly sexual in any mainstream movie. Which is much sexier. Of course. And so the buildup of it, what was implied but not seen, the tension of it as it went from moment to moment, had that feeling of the way a, a sexual encounter actually plays itself out and the anticipation and the imagination of it. Exactly. In the old days, they used to have the tradition of the, the people would go toward one another and they cut to the ocean and waves. Well, you say, what the hell has the ocean got to do with it? But it was, <laughs> it was their signal to you was they're doing something, you know, those two. <laughs> well, uh, today, today there's no ocean. Today you go into the bed, right? 
And they, they, I don't like to see people making love. It's a private affair, you know. My wife always says, I'm paid to bear my emotions, not my backside. You know, and uh, today it's, it's, today it's immoral and carnal, and <laughs> it's not even suggestive, it's right there. But you've had a very interesting, um, it's not evolution, really. That's, that's the wrong word, it's, or at least it's not precise enough. But there's been an interesting track in your career in that you could play vigorous action guys in The Magnificent Seven, in uh, Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, whatever. You could be convincing in a, in a scene with sexual energy with uh, Carol Baker or dancing uh, under the influence with Marilyn Monroe. And then right into the character actor stage, smooth as can be. I was always a character actor, never. Yeah, but the, old, uh, the older character yeah, actor, yeah, I guess, or yeah. the uh, guy in different sorts of roles. You wouldn't have been the psychiatrist necessarily when you were 35 years old. Yeah. In nuts. Someone said, E.G. Marshall said, the only thing you learn from experience is that you never learn anything from experience. And acting is, the, the human condition is a mystifying thing. Some, sometimes I see a man, his wife and child have been lost in a flood. He sits there in the interview and they stick the mic in front of him. And I, to reproduce that is, it takes a magnificent actor. What, he, what that man does, the trauma, the emotion, the, the trying to contain himself because he knows this thing's in his face and they're photographing him, but he, the emotion takes over and he, he, he's dissolved. I think acting... Intelligent people? They have a smattering of a lot because they've been, been in a lot. I mean, I've been in the jungles of Cambodia while we were heating up the Vietnam War. I've been in, on the island of Crete where the Germans took a terrible revenge because their parachutists were shot down. I've had a smattering of knowledge all over the world. I think that when they say to an actor he shouldn't be involved, that means you're relegating me to second-class citizenship. I say, of course, an actor should get involved. Sometimes he talks pure nonsense, but sometimes he's pretty shrewd and smart. Why should the Congress consist only of lawyers? How smart do you have to be, though, to be a good actor? Or not are they very. not? Not very. Some people have a natural talent and have no grasp of anything else. It's like, how smart does a baseball player have to be if he's, a great, he's got a great arm? He doesn't have to be smart. The catcher signals him as to what he wants him to throw, and he throws it, right? Who's an example of a great talent you've worked with where it was almost all just intuitive or just a gift, and the person had no real understanding of his or her craft? They just were good at it. I, I, I don't... I don't like to name names. I don't really know. I, I tell you, when you, I spent a lot of time with Laurence Olivier. When Lord Olivier, if you meet him, he wore suspenders and a belt, and he wrote in very small handwriting. He looked like a clerk somewhere, mm -hmm. you know, until he got up on the stage or the screen, and then something emerged. He was wonderful. What's the most, and maybe this is impossible to single out just one, but maybe you can think of one where somebody got into a reverie they just got into a, a zone in acting and the other people in the scene just step back did that ever happen you ever see somebody just on fire that way you see marlin do it often in the movies when marlin's on the screen it's, it's, he's a genius much as he denies not liking it not doing you see him in the freshman you see a movie club mm -hmm. i did yeah you see that man do Godfather, Mutiny on the Bounty, On the Waterfront. You see a range of performances that are brilliant, brilliant. He does that on the screen. He wipes everybody off the screen. And, I, and he keeps denying. Now, he studied. I did a scene with him once at the actor's studio. I said, I'm an FBI man. We're doing an exercise. I'm coming in to find some drugs in your apartment. Give me a minute, and then you come on. So I'm looking around for the dope. And he comes in, he says, now you use foul language, he says. What the F are you doing? I said, well, uh, the apartment's for rent. No, he said, it's not. It's my apartment. 
I said, well, the landlord, he says, no, don't make up story. And he began, we were improvising. Mm -hmm. Finally, he began to push me, and I said, listen, don't push. If I'm here to look at this apartment, don't push. Then he began, began to use terrible language, and I finally said, watch your language. <laughs> he said, he picked me up and threw me out of the room. And I got criticized for not finding the dope, right? But he was free enough and relaxed enough to do wonderful scenes, wonderful. Do you have to stay? Does it work this way for you? You gotta stay in character after they say cut or you're doing a play and backstage? Because some guys say that. Harvey Keitel sits here and says, I, I want to get into a mindset where I am that person. And if I'm a vicious, homicidal person, I scare people in the trailer. I scare people on the set, my fellow actors. I'll tell you something. If, if, if that were true, then the guy who plays Othello would have to kill Desdemona. And if he's on the stage, he has to get eight Desdemonas a week. <laughs> right? He has to kill her. Right. Because he's in the mood. He's in my... If you haven't got control of your, yourself on the screen, if I have to punch you, and I really punch you, I'm not acting. Acting is making believe. It's as if it were. That's why children are so great. Children say, this is a stove. And the adult says, why are you doing that? The kid says, I know it's not. I'm making believe it's a stove. If an actor gets so carried away and neurotic and has to really get drunk to be drunk, he's not acting. John Huston and Gable and I were doing a scene where we were drunk and Monty Clift was dancing with Marilyn. And I'm playing drunk. They say, cut, we have to relight something. And Houston came over to me and said, do you know the drunkest I ever was? I said, no. He said, yesterday. I said, yeah. He rode a camel in a race against a horse. I said, I saw you yesterday. He says, that's the drunkest I ever was in my life. And he walked back to reshoot the scene. And I realized what he was saying to me is, don't be so damn drunk. That's right, being young, Mr. Kane. Uh, that's right. But you know what they say. Something keeps getting younger all the time. What's he you? Just my life. A drunk says, I'm not drunk, I'm perfectly sober. And yeah. the more he tries rigidly to hold himself, the drunker he is. So don't play the, the end result, work to do... That's part of the method. Do the opposite of something. One famous acting teacher, Bobby Lewis, said, if crying was the measure of great acting, my Aunt Minnie would be better than Dooza. <laughs> right? <laughs> so he says, don't cry, and then the tears will come. You can't... There are mysteries about life, you know, mysteries. Yeah, there was a, a great line, and I think it was between Dustin Hoffman and Laurence Olivier, who performed together in Marathon Man. And you cannot question Dustin Hoffman's success and the quality of his work. So again, it goes back to Ted Williams had one batting stance, Stan Musial had another, and they were both terrific. So Hoffman is a wonderful actor. But when he's going to be all, all disheveled and everything, he says, I'm going to have to stay up for 48 straight hours to appear this ravaged and out of it. And Olivier supposedly looked up at him and said, or you could just try acting. Exactly. Exactly. New film, which is out now, Article 99. Yep. Tell me about that. It's a very interesting movie. Because what JFK did for opening the CIA records and all that, this movie, I think, will do... It asks the question, what is the responsibility of the government to its men who went to war? Where does it stop? They risk their lives, they put it on the line. What is the government's responsibility for medical care? This is a story about veterans' hospitals and the bureaucracy and the budget cutting and, and so on. And it's a very, very well-made movie. Kiefer Sutherland, Leah Thompson, Ray Liotta. I can't think, I hope I didn't leave out any names. Isn't John Mahoney in this? John Mahoney, yeah, he's good. The guy you play is a World War II hero. He spent a lot of time in these veterans' hospitals. And then in comes Kiefer Sutherland, 
as a young doctor? What's the relationship? How does it play? Well, he comes out? in. He comes in briskly. I've been in this hospital. I'm what they call a gomer, which is get that old man out of my emergency room. <laughs> get him out because he's learned the ropes of staying in the hospital. He keeps devising new illnesses that keeps him there because he has no other life. And this young doctor comes in and says, good morning, I'm Dr. Gordon, I'm here to examine you. And I say, it's a waste of time, kid. I've been examined more times than you got wrinkles in your suit. Only I didn't say suit. Uh, and, and slowly I begin to tell him my life. He, he, he wants to know about me and why I'm here. As a young doctor exposed to what we call the detritus, the dirt, the leftovers, the garbage, of a war. Let's see what else we got. I like this. That's my old army hat. Where do you come up with all this stuff? Patient's effects. It's a silver star, isn't it? I was kind of worried about you, kid. But you're okay. After the, the, um, the parade is over, and the band stops playing, and the flags go, and the ticker tape, and the yellow ribbons, after that, you've got a residue. You've got the after effect. If they show you pictures of what happened in Iraq, with children now and, and so on. Or you see veterans coming back from this war, or Vietnam. Vietnam, the other day, a guy went off his rocker He's, and started shooting. What is the responsibility of the government for that? What do we do? Article 99 is in theaters now, and soon the movie you did uh, that De Niro's in and uh, my buddy Robert Wall is in, Mistress, that should be out soon too, right? Yes. Okay, it was, it was great to spend this time with you. I enjoyed it, Bob. Eli Wallach, folks. See you later.